Misco Electric here. Welcome to the second episode of The Current, weekly EV news. Our goal is to produce the most helpful 10 minutes of EV and electrification content anywhere with insider perspective and synthesis whenever possible. I'll start by following up with one of last week's stories. Tesla's German factory is back up and running after grid arson disabled power. Production resumed on Wednesday morning and experts estimate losses of over $430 million. CEO Elon Musk visited the facility upon restart to boost morale and double down on his intentions to expand the facility in spite of opposition. He told the workers and government officials in attendance that Giga Berlin will eventually produce the next generation compact EV. He also said that he thought it made sense to bring the Tesla Semi to production there. But he stopped shy of making a commitment. Speaking of heavy duty vehicles, you've probably heard about the federal government's NEVI program, which funds the nationwide installation of 500,000 fast public EV chargers by the end of 2026. This week, the federal government has revealed its strategy to support infrastructure for zero emissions class four through six commercial vehicles, like last mile delivery trucks, local work and service trucks, and school buses. And it will also support classes seven and eight, like garbage trucks, buses, dump trucks, and eventually long haul semis. The strategy is divided into four phases, resolving in 2040. According to government statistics, 75% of heavy truck traffic takes place on just 4% of the country's roads, which is why the maps resemble a rail route. With battery prices dropping rapidly, zero emission, medium, and heavy duty vehicle infrastructure may well be the first real battleground between battery electric and hydrogen companies. Proponents of hydrogen are aggressively lobbying and raising capital, so I don't rule them out, but I'll leave that technology for others to cover. Federal Highway Administrator Shaylin Bott said, medium and heavy duty trucks in our current freight network contribute approximately 23% of greenhouse gas emissions in the US transportation sector. These new designations and strategy will help to grow our national EV charging network, encourage clean commerce within the freight community, and support the president's goals of achieving net zero emissions for the nation by 2050. Publicly, government leaders continue to identify reduced emissions as the reason for all of this aggressive investment. From my perspective, the real win is in energy independent domestic transportation system. We currently move most people and goods using foreign oil. Switching to regional electricity will improve our nation's political autonomy, price stability, and GDP. How do you view the return on this investment? I'll link more information about the infrastructure strategy below. Porsche did not disappoint this week with their unveiling of the most powerful series production Porsche of all time. The Taycan Turbo GT and Turbo GT with YSOC package made quite the entrance. Porsche has claimed the fastest ever Laguna Seca production EV lap time for an unmodified production car with production tires. They did it in 1 minute 27.87. The Taycan Turbo GT is equipped with a familiar 97 kilowatt hour battery, two speed gearbox, and the same front motor as the Turbo S. It has a new rear motor and pulse inverter, which can temporarily push up to 900 amps, up 50% from the Turbo S at 600 amps. The new attack mode boost of 160 horsepower lasts for up to 10 seconds. It's based on the push to pass function on the Porsche 99X Formula E race car. This boost feature can also be found on the Genesis GV60. I featured each of those in videos linked in the description below. All turbo GTs include the Dynamics package with Porsche's active ride suspension and GT specific tuning. They also have ceramic brakes and 21 inch forged wheels with summer tires. The YSAC package incorporates lightweighting measures, including reducing to one charge port, carbon fiber components, and those forged wheels. The carbon fiber rear wing provides 485 pounds of downforce. Compared to the standard Turbo GT, the YSOC package drops 154 pounds, partly due to the deleted rear seats. It can deliver peak output of 1,092 horsepower and 988 pound-feet of torque. The top speed is 189 miles per hour, and it can deliver a 0 to 60 mile per hour time of 2.1 seconds. Both variants of the Taycan Turbo are set to achieve around 345 miles of range on Europe's WLTP test cycle. I'd expect a lower figure under the recently revised EPA standard, which tends to yield more accurate range estimates. 
The 2025 Porsche Taycan Turbo GT starts at $231,995 and reservations are open now. I'll link the configurator below in the description if you want to explore more. Would you rather have a Porsche Taycan Turbo GT, Tesla Model S Plaid, or Lucid Air Sapphire? Last week, commenters had a lot of opinions about the Dodge Daytona EV's Fretsonic exhaust system, which makes an otherwise silent EV very, very noisy. Porsche Taycans also offer electric sport sound in the cabin and outside. Do you like the idea better on a quarter of a million dollar Porsche? While we're on the topic of noise, General Motors also wanted a piece of the news cycle, so they almost made an announcement about a future announcement of a concept which could one day resemble a production vehicle. The upcoming Cadillac Opulent Velocity EV concept will supposedly count noise among its features. That is literally all they shared. <laughs> is that news? Not really, but you can't say I didn't mention it. This week, there was more good news for Rivian. At the annual National Truck Equipment Association's Work Truck Week in Indianapolis, Indiana, commercial vehicle manufacturer Morgan Olson announced that they've chosen Rivian's skateboard platform for their C250E electric delivery vans. The C250E will be centered around Rivian's 100 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate battery pack, software stack, and user interface. This deal matters in part because Morgan Olson has been selected to manufacture EVs for Canada's primary postal delivery service provider, Canada Post. Canada Post has already converted 1,400 of its 14,000 mail delivery vehicles to EVs or hybrids as a part of their plan to fully electrify by 2040. That means there are 12,600 to go. Rivian electric delivery vans already deliver my Amazon packages, and it's exciting to imagine millions of Canadians receiving their mail under Rivian Power 2. Morgan Olson Chief Operating Officer Joe Thompson says he sees Rivian as the answer to the need for electrified light-duty commercial vehicles. Morgan Olson's parent company, J.B. Poindexter & Co., owns many companies which build commercial truck bodies, step fans, service utility trucks, van bodies, funeral coaches, limousines, mid-sized buses, cargo management systems, pickup truck caps, tonneau covers, and accessories. Poindexter has confirmed that they expect to develop prototypes in other categories based on the Rivian platform. Remember, Tesla and Kia dominate the consumer EV market in North America. Neither of them currently sell or license their EV underpinnings in this way. Amazon's exclusive rights to the Rivian commercial van platform ended last November. The market appears to be wide open for an automaker like Rivian to scale this up if the Morgan Olson partnership is a success. Rivian's normal Illinois manufacturing facility is currently sized to produce up to 150,000 vehicles a year. Their 2024 guidance to investors projects fewer than 60,000 EVs will be sold. Even if they deliver another 20,000 delivery vans to Amazon and other clients, there's plenty of headroom for a significant volume of platforms to be produced. What's more, Rivian plans to expand annual capacity to 215,000 in order to bring the R2 platform online by 2026. As a publicly traded company, which is currently spending far more money than it earns, there are a lot of eyes on Rivian. Would you tune in to a detailed look at Rivian's operations and prospects for survival if I produced a video on that topic? If so, let me know in the comments. If there's enough interest, I'll publish that on the Misco Electric Industry Channel. Geely's subsidiary Polestar has announced new variants of the Polestar 3 ahead of its delivery this summer. The entry price is now $73,400, down from $78,900. The long-range dual-motor variant will be the entry model for now. All Polestar 3s will include the pilot package consisting of pilot assist, driver assistance aids, park assist pilot, lane change assist, and 360-degree cameras. Polestar has now made the Plus package optional. It includes luxury amenities like a 25-speaker Bowers & Wilkins sound system, head-up display, power steering column, heated steering wheel, and rear heated seats and soft-closed doors. Loaded up, a Polestar 3 can top out over $90,000. In 2019 and 2020, I traveled North America and Europe working with Polestar as a product expert, introducing their first electric model, the 2. They initially delivered a fully loaded launch edition and made lower price configurations available as production ramped. This time, it appears as if the opposite is true. Several costly upgrades, including LiDAR, will not initially be available. 
a lower entry price will allow many drivers to take advantage of a $7,500 federal subsidy on leases on an initial batch of Chinese import Polestar 3s. When production begins in Ridgevale, South Carolina starting the second half of 2024, I expect the Polestar 3 will qualify for a $7,500 EV point of sale purchase subsidy as well. I first published a walk around of the Polestar 3 in January of 2023 at the Consumer Electronics Show and I have admired it since then. Volvo's 7-seat EX90 electric SUV will be built in the same factory as the Polestar 3. Which one do you like more? The Financial Times is reporting this week that Mercedes-Benz CEO Ola Kalinius is urging Brussels to lower tariffs on EVs imported from China. He said, don't raise tariffs. I'm a contrarian. I think, go the other way around. Take the tariffs that we have and reduce them. He went on to say that Chinese companies looking to export to Europe was a natural progression of competition and it needs to be met with better products, better technology, more agility. That is the market economy. Let competition play out. It is important to consider his company's ownership when evaluating these statements. Together, Chinese automakers Geely and SAIC own 20% of Mercedes-Benz shares. More than 30% of Mercedes-Benz vehicles are purchased in China. That said, I completely agree with this statement. A government's effort to squash competition and prop up corporations which produce inferior products only delay and exacerbate the fallout. Complacent competitors do not serve the best interests of humanity. Some global car companies rely on the Chinese market too heavily to take any kind of stance against China. For example, 40% of Volkswagen's car sales last year were attributed to China. Stellantis, Ford, and GM each own joint ventures with Chinese companies. Tesla is the only American company operating independently in China, but their Shanghai factory is the most productive and services much of the world, including Canada and Europe. The situation is complicated and fascinating. Soon, I'll publish an in-depth piece dedicated to exploring the topic of Chinese EVs and the various paths forward. You'll be able to find that on the Misco Electric Industry Channel, where I typically share factory tours and executive interviews. On to the next story. Fisker, a publicly traded and asset light EV startup, has seen its valuation plummet from $8 billion to $95 million over the last two years. Reports that bankruptcy is on the horizon have been downplayed by its founder, who suggests that a major automaker is in talks for a partnership which could improve their outlook. Now, I have years of professional experience working in the wake of Henrik Fisker and know a lot about the history there. In order to tell the whole story, I've published a separate video which offers great detail up to the present day. It's linked in the description. Japanese automakers Nissan and Honda have signed a non-binding memorandum of understanding for a feasibility study focused around a strategic collaboration on upcoming EV components as well as artificial intelligence and automotive software platforms. The partnership is designed to cut costs on these future automotive technologies. Nissan CEO said they are open to working together with Honda in any region, both in Japan and overseas. While Nissan and Honda are merely considering working together someday, Nissan has a long-standing alliance with Mitsubishi and with French automaker Renault. Nissan has also invested in Renault's European EV business unit called Ampera which engineers and produces electric vehicle platforms and software. Honda's first electric SUV, the Prologue, is built at the General Motors plant in Mexico as a part of their EV alliance. GM's Ultium platform hasn't been going well, and Honda has canceled future EV partnerships with them. Established automakers must collaborate in order to reach profitability producing electric vehicles. Acquisitions and failures will also be a part of the industry's shift towards greater manufacturing efficiency and the production of automobiles with low service revenue. In your view, which legacy automakers are least likely to survive this wave of innovation? With spring springing and tax returns rolling in, many of you are probably shopping online for e-bikes. Over the last several years, I've reviewed about 70 e-bikes and micro-mobility devices. That work is now available on YouTube on the Misco Electric Ride Reviews channel. I recently published seven episodes of a series called the Go Electric E-Bike Buying Guide. I start with the basics of what the market has on offer today, then I comb through each category showing what you can expect at a given price point and what you should look out for. I also share discount codes for many reputable brands. I hope you'll head over there, subscribe, and share the educational series with family and friends who might find it helpful. Well, that's all for this week's edition of The Current. 
let me know in the comments what stories you'd like me to look into for next week's episode. Please consider subscribing and sharing this video if you found some value in this coverage. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, drive, fly, ride, go electric.